All right. Welcome, everybody, to the April 21st episode of MV Office Hours. It's really awesome to see you all. Uh, welcome back after a long break. I hope you had a nice, uh, I don't know, a couple of days off. I'm not sure if uh, we all celebrated the same way, but hopefully you got the day off. Um, Dale and myself are on today. Joy is having some spotty Wi-Fi, so we're hoping to see her later. Um, but we're all available through LinkedIn and Twitter in a variety of ways, and our uh, at MVP Office Hours uh, link, or excuse me, Twitter uh, tag still works. You can also use the uh, Gmail if you want to get a hold of us. But uh, your best friend is always the Success Community. Uh, post there at mention. Drop your questions. Add your files. Um, it's really the best place to get everybody to uh, get some attention right away. Anyone have warning errors? Sorry, everybody. I'm picturing Hal from Space Odyssey. I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Squire. <laughs> well, you know how I always have to run two screens and every once in a while Zoom will be like, I'm just going to mute everything and cause everyone a headache. So I had to like <laughs> jump over to it quick. So um, as always, uh, welcome to the current and future MVPs. Please share your experience. Uh, add any input you've got. We're not uh, here to show off on anybody's knowledge. We're here to display all of our uh, learning and opportunities. Please post the links you need uh, and resources and answers in the chat. We'll capture as much of it as we can. If you got a question, post it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll get to you as soon as possible. There's always a couple things in the, in the success community that we bring in. Uh, please share your screen. Remember, it's being recorded. We just got done fighting with all those buttons. It will be there for the uh, forever and ever and ever. And so if it's something that shouldn't be recorded, um, then keep that in mind. Especially if you shouldn't be recorded or your data, um, we we don't have a, a a plan to edit any of that out. And lastly, trying to have fun, trying try to be informal, but please keep it as professional as possible because it is recorded for uh, perpetuity of the internets, and we don't want anyone to have uh, any troubles. And that said, we're on to the next upcoming community events. So summer tends to be our busiest time for community events. We've got three showing up in May, just in the U.S., Mid-Atlantic, SunCal, and uh, Texas Dreamin'. Um, there's several overseas, I believe, Czech Dreamin' and... Uh, I think Albania is coming yes, up. Yes, that's the one. Yes. Um, so lots going on, especially, and then additionally, Salesforce has World Tours and the Tableau Conference and Connections all coming up in the next month, month and a half. So um, always, always, always keep the events page handy on Trailblazer uh, to make sure that if there's an opportunity for you to participate, uh, you can. Joy made it. We're hoping that she's able to stay connected to Wi-Fi. If not, we totally understand. <laughs> And with that, um, I did forget, but um, we will be back on our normal schedule in May, first uh, Friday, first and third Friday, and the next one will be the fifth. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll be um, seeing you all then. So why don't we get kicked off with a couple things. The first one being that I just wanted to give uh, John some props. I wasn't sure if he was going to make it today. Excuse me. But uh, John had several questions over the course of, I want to say, February and March about some test classes and some challenges he was having deploying code uh, and the way it was interacting with, um, I'm going to bring it up right now so I don't put my foot in my mouth. Um, I want to say it was the email enablement, maybe? And uh, he was kind enough to not only post us uh, uh, his resolution because we weren't able to help, but also find a knowledge uh, article. It was really awesome for him to do that. Um, and so it was, let me see here. Lightning Sync. So Lightning Sync was causing some issues. Uh, he added the knowledge uh, article. Uh, it was just a great way to close up that conversation. So if you do have anything, uh, pertaining to that in the future, uh, if it is in our success, feel free to jump over there. Or we'll bring it back up when necessary. Um, the next one was Anil, who asked a qu question about uh, using a Lightning Web component to develop um, a pin or unpin option like you do with a list view. Uh, he had mentioned multiple groups, and I believe there was some uh, feedback from developer 
uh, success, um, but I wanted to make sure if he joined, I've had a chance to talk through any of it. I don't see him on the list, so we'll move on from there. Uh, third, we had Rochelle posting a question about, and I think this is probably even without her here, a good topic, um, the sunset of Salesforce A and the idea that without Salesforce A, how as a admin are you lock, unlocking or unfreezing or troubleshooting issues that your users might have without a laptop? Uh, there was a couple kind of tongue-in-cheek responses like take your laptop, but um, what else is there? So um, raise your hand. Do you use Salesforce A? Does anyone on the call use it or used to use it, I should say? I used to use it a ton. Um, yeah. In my current role, I, I don't need it. Um, but the the availability to be like, hey, something's going down. We want you to handle this now was amazing. Um, even if that's something that was going down was someone's getting a review that we're a little bit concerned about. Can you just freeze them? Um, or someone's getting laid off. Can you freeze their user? Can you like um it it saved my tail in so many situations at previous jobs. Um, and really was the fastest way to handle things. Also, like if there was a security issue, if someone got locked out, like you could reset their password like in the moment. Um, but I have help desk now, so I don't have to do it. <laughs> and when I was a solo admin, I used it a lot. I could mm -hmm. be off, but I was the solo admin. So I was at an amusement park going, yeah, let me fix that. Yeah, literally. I, pl yeah, plus one to that. Like it was unfortunately the best tool a solo admin could have, and I say unfortunately because it's the worst thing for for work life balance. Um, I, well, but the, but the thing is, Dale, it actually allowed you to like handle something in a moment instead of being like, oh, I need my laptop. I need to log in. I need to be at home. Right. I, I don't was, care if I I if I'm not in front of my laptop, it's for a reason. It's a personal. But it reason. also. It also allowed my boss to have that access. Oh, good point. Which, yeah. So, with anything, don't mm -hmm. be the point of failure. Um, yep. And yep. So, if possible. Totally, totally agree. Um. So, I'm sad about it, but has I, I, I think it's one of those like if 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 we're if I could give my two cents on it, I think it's they had the best of intentions of making it mobile. Um, I'd be surprised if there wasn't much of an appetite for it, honestly. Um, it was kind of clunky, at least from what I remember. It wasn't mm -hmm. the best experience. Um, there's a better way to, to do it. And I'm sure they've figured out giving those capabilities in a better way, but you know. Let's hope so. Time. Let's hope so for all the small, the small orgs and the solo admins, right. something something is around the corner because that, I think that was a huge resource. Um, but literally like for the freeze and unfreeze, like everything else was, well, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't use it for anything else. It was nice to have quick access to trust and, mm. and at least notes back in the day. I mean, it's gotten a little bit harder to deal with, but. I, I guess there's also part of me that wonders how much of the need has gone away as MFA and SSO gets a larger audience mm -hmm. you really have to freeze it at the salesforce level or can you let like active directory or an octa administrator or something like that um flip the switch on it because they're if, if you're getting laid off salesforce isn't your only problem mm -hmm. agreed 100 agreed that's a really good point dale ma'am you're always thinking most of the time, it's a problem. Sometimes it's beneficial. Is there is there other options for the uh, Salesforce A feature set without going to the laptop? I don't think we have any ideas. Mm -mm. Right? Can you just use a web browser on your phone? Their mobile device and just go to if like you can, if you can log in and if and if and if like you yes you can do that but it's not mobile friendly yeah oh well yeah but it's like the only so, alternative at this so point. depending on how big your screen is um it's really hard um i've done that also um not awesome nope. i've done i did that when it was classic 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I haven't done that since we've been in Lightning. So. <laughs> yeah. Because I had Salesforce A. So I don't know how Salesforce reacts in Lightning on a mobile device, but that's definitely like something that you could do if you needed it. Um, but it's it's not great. Yeah, I, I mean, it feels like I'm going to put my foot on my mouth and say that the world's come a long way since A came out and like everyone has a laptop in their pocket all the time and maybe they're just feeling like they don't want to support it or there's something else coming. But I know I don't want to carry my laptop up to the beach, but if I had to, I guess I have to. So, all right. I will say if you're told you have to, Time to go look for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah I, I remember the old solo admin days where it was like, well, I, I could hand this off to the help desk who has no idea and they're going to make it worse. So I guess I have to support it, but um, you're, you're not wrong. Um, okay, uh, why don't we move on to uh, Jack's question uh, about DevOps. So um, rather than read it, Jack, do you want to summarize your question and then uh and save me the embarrassment of reading your post uh save you the, my embarrassment of you reading my post Jimmy. <laughs> all right yeah i'm just i'm you know we've been using devops for the better part of a few months now and i we're having i feel like we're just running into more conflicts with it than we should be and it ends up killing a bunch of time and most of these specifically revolve around trying to manage like sorry if i'm echoing uh like what we call like a hot fix right like somebody needs permission to view a field or something like that or even just a new field being added something that's like a quick one day turnaround versus well concurrently working on projects that are like bigger in scope you know building multiple objects that need to work in concert together with flows and things like that and then so I'm, I'm wondering if anybody has any, adv- and I just can't find any like good examples or documentation online. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place, but like, are people running like multiple pipelines that merge into each other at, at a certain point along the pipeline, right? Like they share one of the repo branches, maybe at like the bundling stage or the stage right before production or do all of your projects end at the production level or do you have some of them release into another sandbox and then like you do another project run from there up i guess i'm just curious how people are managing it because i mean we're trying like a couple of projects here and running into conflicts and things and i'm i mean there must be organizations that are attempting to do stuff like this that are much larger than my own with many admins trying to manage the work items and things so i don't know that's sort of sorry sorry about that um that was going to be my first question is the scale question is how many users, how many ongoing projects, how many sandboxes, like get, what, are, what are the numbers of those kinds of things that you're working with? Because there's always the possibility that you're trying to overbake it and that might be part of the problem. So what are, what are you working with? Cause that'll help get you to, to the right solution. So there, there's me and like another admin and we basically split work in the, company but we do a lot of stuff like we're very i hate even using the word but like agile uh firm in that like people request things and for better or for worse they expect turnaround within like a day or so and we can deliver it because i have two admins with a small user group um as far as the number of projects i mean it could be any number and they all overlap like everything in our environment has to deal with like one or two major objects, custom objects that are like our key objects used by everything. Um, So it's very hard to work on a longer term project that isn't going to be updating a lightning page layout that was touched by like a hot fix, you know, a few days earlier or something like that. And so a couple of admins, is there any programmatic development work or is it all in the declarative and configuration space i mean what would you consider programmatic work i mean is it like apex or lightning web components or anything like that for the most part no very rarely no uh we're we're using devops to do you know flows uh system change field change it's it's all 
no is the short answer. I mean, I know a lot of people are going to like throw rocks at me for saying this, but like it almost sounds like change sets, like just keep it simple and go with change sets and don't over don't overdo it. I mean, I know DevOps is the big new hot thing that's been around for a while, but everybody's jumping on it now, but you don't have to overdo it. You don't need a Ferrari to go to the grocery store. Yeah, I know. We, I mean, so we we were big proponents of change sets too, and we used them all the time, but we did constantly overwrite each other's work and like not realize it right away. And unfortunately, we're dealing with things in our environment that like affect people's lives and are very like, fair. we can't make mistakes. So having some sort of change management that is like keeping an eye on us, not removing work or undoing other people's work is sort of very advantageous to us but oh, I mean oh, so I'm I'm curious why aren't you just deploying them like any other change even if it is a hot fix you can deploy hourly if you needed to to prod and it, and your compare and and sync is always going to be up to date it's using the standard github model so say more about why it wouldn't just work as intended so say we have so like the hotfix stuff, like day to day, like our hotfix changes or like these quick changes are easy. Yeah, we promote the work items up, boom, 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 no problem at all. So say that there's another, I have another project going in a separate pipeline, right? It also terminates in production. And it has, because I opened the work item to like start work on that maybe like four or five days ago, and I haven't finished work on that work item Got it. it hasn't synced in between and a lot of things have happened. So now when I try to push up, I hit all sorts of conflicts, obviously, and I, I get buried in like merging conflicts that half the time seem to not work anyway once you do merge them and try to promote and I'm destroying pipelines and it just yeah. gets messy real quick. So, so I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, uh, I'm feeling like the issue is you don't normally have multiple prod endpoints, right? Because like when you, when you, from a source control perspective, you've effectively developed two source control models because you, they, they both are hitting your production, your, your final step in two different directions. You could have multiple pipelines, but you have to at some point merge those branches into a single deployment pipeline, your source. If you've got multiple pipelines to prod, you've effectively got two source controls and you're actually breaking DevOps. Yeah. So what I've been doing then, or what I think you're saying is what I have been doing, which is like two or three environments prior to production. Now I, I, I map it so that they use the same repo. And in that way, I'm like merging my pipelines prior to production. Right. Yeah. So hypothetically, you've got a production box. You've got to make it simple, a, an integration box that's immediately prior to it. And you've got your pipelines mapped to the integration box. So you know that your source control originates at integrate. And then you've got a single path from integrate to production. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? Yeah. So two, two separate pipelines. And when you declare your environments, right, you have to also say what branch of your repo you're going to use. So both pipelines are using the same repo. And then... The like dev environments have their own branches and I merge the branch or whatever at the integrate mm -hmm. environment. And then every uh, environment after that also is using the same branch all the way up the line. Yep. Okay. So then the next question I have is why do you need such dramatic pipelines? Like I've seen that sort of build in a really dynamic infrastructure but like if it's just two of you working on a small org have you overcomplicated your pipeline I, I very well could have you know i'm basing all of my my work on the documentation i can find online sure. which is not great you know they give an example of setting up a single pipeline with a work item and how you would like move it up the things Yep. And so we're, you know, i'm like all right i'll, I'll use the default environments here i know i can change them i but Maybe I do on all these things with, you know, we're trying to be good, good boys and like do user testing and things outside of production, but um, maybe it's not necessary. So you're, you're suggesting reduce the number of environments, merge it right away at integration right out of the gate. So like the very first thing you promote is already integrated and up there. Um, I'm not suggesting that as much as ensure that you don't have two pipeline entry points to production. 
So like if you need 10 boxes between production and where your work is happening, that's fine. But if you think about just a standard GitHub repository, they're all working their way back to a single source of truth. And that's ending up in production. You're deploying from there. And mm-hmm. if you've got two, even if it's just a couple objects or, or, or sorry, environments or multiples, if they aren't comparing to each other, they've ba- you basically built in a like like a a, a a a way to have two source controls by not having them merge and not even like I want to make sure two people are still confused by why you'd bundle. You don't have to bundle, but I, you still need to have all your your deployment pipelines connect to each other at some point so that you're doing a compare within yeah. that pipeline before it gets to prod. That's really the, where the benefit comes from, in my opinion. Yeah, which okay, so I'm I, I'm doing the right thing now, which is merging those pipelines by having them share a repo at a earlier environment. It sounds like I think so. And then okay. as far as hot fixes, I've seen a couple workarounds. The the one that I keep seeing is, and and obviously it takes a lot of uh, change management, but change set from your dev box to prod with your your uh your hotfix but then mm-hmm. check it into your pipeline for compares and all the other workflows all the other branches to see oh but don't really it. run it up okay that's interesting so it's, you're basically deploying something that doesn't need to be deployed at the end but you, it now gets merged into your pipeline i don't know if that's the best way to do it but i've seen people do that if you've got like i need to fix this now but i also need to check it into my source control and i can't just make a today of deployment that's a, that's one thing i've seen um I did see someone post, uh, I think Jen Lang, oh, Jen Lang, yeah. Um, the the DevOps Center success group, Karen and uh, actually, the, I think the team just changed again, but they're great. And they're more than happy to talk about this stuff in great detail if you wanted to get into it. So um, definitely. You said there's a community group for it? Yeah, so the, the DevOps Center success group I'll is managed out. by Karen uh, Fidelic and... I'm trying to remember uh, who is in charge or who's helping there now. Uh, uh, oh, you did post there. Um, just no no responses from that group yet. Um, who is the other gentleman? I'm not seeing it immediately, but they're usually really responsive. I'm surprised that they didn't uh, comment on your post already. Wait, are um, you talking about in the Slack or in the, what are we in, looking at here? In success. Oh, I don't even remember posting it there how long ago. <laughs> so um, it's fine. I'll I'll dig it up and look. But yeah, so yeah, no. I, um, someone. Oh, you know what? I think it, it's showing up in the in the success because Jen Lang at mentioned the group in her response. So now it's showing up there. Got so it. Maybe it's just a matter of time. I mean, it it just showed up today at two thirty eight. So oh, somebody I mean, meetings over. It, it might come right back. <laughs> so um, but I think I I mean I'll, I'll reiterate. I think you built in a gap because of multiple feeds to prod and you should have a single feed to prod but you can have multiple branches merge prior to it and that would be the and best sorry, way when you're that. saying a single feed to prod does that mean a single pipeline like you have a single pipeline in devops and that's it um well or can yeah, i do yes. multiple pipelines I mean, and, and merge them with that like sharing of the uh github repo Yes, I, I, I'm kind of saying that. I mean, we, this is probably worth a longer conversation, but the gist of it is that your your core repo based on prod, if you have multiple pipel- pipelines with an origination of prod, you've now effectively got two source control repositories and they're never going to see each other until they try to merge at prod on their own versus letting DevOps say, Jax and Squire's work has to play nice before I deploy it. And that's all you're really trying to accomplish. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm doing, maybe I'm explaining it wrong. Like, okay. If I have three environments in, in two pipelines, right? The yeah. last environment, sorry, uh, my screen. Would it, be, would it help to, to put a picture up of your pipeline with that? Probably, I'm trying to, I don't think there's anything in there that would be giveaway. Let me, I can share my screen here. One yeah, second. Let me stop sharing here quick. I think it'll be really valuable. And then we can make sure we can answer that question. If there's other questions too, I don't mean to chew up this no, entire we, we thing. We don't have any hands raised. We don't have anything in the chat. Okay. I'm, I'm still just going to have kind of lurking over in the corner, the question of. Is, <laughs> Why am I not using chain sets? <laughs> no, well, no, nope. not so much that, but like is, is three 
are the numbers too high? Like based on the scale of your overall organization, is there too much, is, is there more going on than really needs to be? Like, does it need to start? Yeah. With, what's the intent of how often, because you said earlier, like trying to be agile. I mean, there's many ways to do agile. So I want to make sure that like the perception of the common perception of agile isn't governing this. The common perception of DevOps isn't governing this. Like I want to make sure that we're not getting, that you're not getting down a, a hole that you don't need to be down just based on the scale of your org. That's all. Sure. So real quick, I, I, I have two pipeline or two active projects right now, right? That we're actively doing work in. The pipelines are identical as far as the environments go, development, integration, UAT, staging, and production, right? Yeah. The, uh, they both are tied to the same GitHub repository. So they both have the same branches for main, staging, and UAT. And then at integration, it is a different branch for each pipeline and the development environments are different for each pipeline. So my yeah. idea was you would do your work, you'd move it up, you'd integrate with your current project or whatever. And then when you pushed up into UAT, that's when like the merging of those uh, pipelines would happen as it were prior to getting into our staging and production environments. Okay. So, so go ahead. Sorry. So, I mean, my first question is if it's just you, another dad and another, or another admin, and then hot fixes, why the three? Are there that many disparate changes happening at any given time that warrant having them separated into three boxes? Probably not, but the three boxes that you're seeing there aren't my problem. I, I, I don't have a problem with conflicts there. What I have a problem with is conflicts of changes that happened in my other pipeline, right? So like I made changes in my other pipeline, I got them to merge in at the UAT level with other hot fixes that had happened over the previous days, pushed everything up into production. And then we went back down into a work item that happened to be open for like a day or two uh, in the like hot fix pipeline or whatever. And it was missing stuff. It was unable to sync because of the open work item with the higher up things that had happened. So when we tried to push back up into the first level of integration, it threw all sorts of problems and errors and things. So, but maybe that's just the so, nature of the beast. I don't know. Like, no, no. So I think, I think, what, wanna, oh, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> sorry. I'm, I, my connection is unstable. So I'm on the phone and no video. <laughs> um, one of the things I'm hearing is that you're starting a work item from like a, his, a place in history. You're not starting your, this work item from, now and so what i think is important you do is that when you start that new hot fix like that work item that's from a couple days ago or whatever that you start from what your production looks like now you can't you can't go back in time and work on this former version of what production was then you have to work on what is happening now um, because you can't work on a past environment when you're working on something that you're going to push to a hot fix, you have to work on what is happening now. Um, and when VS Code, because we're not using DevOps Center and VS Code, and I'm going to try to explain this as terribly as possible because I'm really <laughs> bad at VS Code and GitHub. One of the the steps is like always like always get pull, always make sure you have the like the freshest version that you're supposed to have when you're putting all the things together. And that's the one thing that I keep hearing you go back to is that you're going back to this like historical place in time, a historical version of your space that you're trying to work on. And then when you push that forward, it, it doesn't match. It's missing that hot fix from previous. And so yeah. it's really yeah. important that the, that your, um, that your hot fixes go backwards. I'm, I'm, I'm it's here. Just, to, I guess what I don't understand is how I manage, uh, like in the a, DevOps system, big, I have no idea. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you do with like a big project that you can't like? I'm not going to get all the work done in a single day on it. Maybe I need to be making more work items. And the idea is, is that a work item is never open past a single day or something like that. You well, just and, can't and I think, and there, 
Go ahead, Dale. You've got guidance, like because that's another thing to, to, to scrutinize in this process is what's your definition of a work item? Is that metadata that you're doing? Is it a user requirement? Is like work item? I don't know. You guys tell me. Like, do I need to do? Am I am I supposed to make a separate work item for every field that I need to change? And then the permission sets that get updated with it, and then the like flow that it is going to be used in. Do they all get their own work items, and each one is promoted sure. separately and individually? Nothing wrong with that approach. I mean, if, if you wanted to go with the definition of agile development, it's having your requirement down to the smallest, most immediately Possible deployable thing. degree mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I I agree, and I I sorry, I couldn't see who was talking before. It's joy. It was joy. joy. Oh, okay. Thanks, joy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with what you're saying, and yeah, it does seem like the underlying problem here is that things are like out of sync, obviously, and that's where the conflicts are coming from. So, all right, maybe it just needs to be a policy change where we're working in more incremental, smaller, more also, agile, I, as it were. I think we talked items. about this earlier. Was like a release schedule, right? Like your your constituents, if you will, really expect this like one and two day turnaround. And that's really aggressive. Um, you <laughs> can do it. It's it's really aggressive, Jack. A that's lot of that's funny be because like, I was embellishing our turnaround times and really people expect things in like one or two hours often for So <laughs> I'm going to say this as the All right, consultant. So it's not just aggressive, it's, it's a different word. <laughs> so as a consultant in the room, that's 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 the nature of customer orgs you are the consultant to your customer like if you're on the it side like there needs to be an expectation and you need some kind of advocacy that says sorry that's not possible let's figure that out um even like I, i'm going to go back to st stage one of all of this have you process map have you process mapped what this process should be because again it goes back to the inputs of how many changes are you seeing the ish per period of time, whether it's two weeks, month, quarter, whatever, how many hot fixes are you having? I'll be honest, I mean, we haven't mapped it because I, I don't know what the, the the answer is or like based on even those, you know, the questions you're answer, asking me, if I answered all those, I wouldn't know how to, I don't know what like the best practice is, I guess, and, and following for documentation that is provided for best practice has left me where I am currently, I guess. Gotcha. I mean, I would say if you have any way, whether it's going through emails, whether it's going through like DMs, whether it's going through whatever, try to quantify how many of what kinds of requests you're receiving over what periods of times. If there's any way to like as your starting point, if there's any way to then go back and and ask, OK, how did we triage? How did we plan? How did we develop? How did we implement and putting time boxes around those? Um, how much energy, how much resourcing, what specific technical solution you put into it. These are all inputs that then guide the decision of, okay, we want to be agile. Got it. It means you got sprints. Is a sprint, is a two week sprint, which is the average, but not the rule? Is that right? Is it a three week sprint? Heck, mm -hmm. is it a one week sprint? I wouldn't necessarily advocate for that, but having the actual tangible data of, what you're doing there and what you have done will inform the decision of how your organization, which is different than company A, company B, company C, company D, that will that will give you your framework to get you to, and here's what our release schedule will be. And here's what our requirements for development sandboxes will be um, versus a hot fix box. Like, I I mean, I, I know I'm old man on the on the porch here saying this. I haven't been an admin for like six and a half, seven years, and a crap ton has changed <laughs> since then. Um, but I was a solo admin for an organization that had 250 users. I was able, I I and maybe it's because I had to, because we didn't have all these fancy toys that you young whippersnappers have now. But <laughs> I had one dev box, I had one stage box, and I had production. And it all got done there because it was one source of truth. I'm questioning, do you need three sources of truth from a development standpoint to then feed into a dev box? You may have, you may not have the scale to warrant that yet. But starting with how many fixes versus how much metadata change, schema change versus flows versus reports versus any any number of things, being able to quantify those 
and actually understand what is our workload and what will it take to accomplish it the most efficiently and the most quickly, you need that numerical data first to then guide the how. Okay, so I'm 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 hearing slow my roll. Maybe don't even bother with DevOps. And actually, now so, yeah, go yeah, 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 to, yeah, to the drawing board. Also, everybody <laughs> hates change sets. Well, I hate change sets. Yeah. Uh, from what I've heard of DevOps Center, it is the new change sets. It's it's what got people off of having to live in change sets. Um, so DevOps Center may still be the solution that does the implementing through the boxes. But I don't know that you need to go to the scale of you having a dev box, your colleague having a dev box, Hotfix having a dev box, to then funnel into integration, to then funnel into UAT, to then funnel into stage. Like depending on how many users you have and how many changes you're doing, um, your UAT and stage may be one in the same. You sure. So even the number of boxes aside, it sounds like you're advocating a single pipeline. Don't run multiple pipelines. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, and I think so. I, I want to jump in here really quick because everything Dale and Joy are saying and everybody's saying is really valuable from a like a process or an understanding. But technically speaking, I want to make sure there's an understanding. So every project is its own GitHub branch. Correct. So don't confuse what GitHub is doing with your Salesforce instances. The sandboxes are doing a push pull from your repository and replicating what's in that repository. So what I'm and what I mean by that is if you've got a branch that is checking into UAT, it doesn't actually ever look at UAT. It's looking at your GitHub repository and saying, does this match what I think I'm matching? And now push it into UAT. If you've got two pipelines pushing to UAT, they don't know about each other. So if you go to GitHub, you likely have a a completely unique uh, source control for each of those pipelines. Don't confuse that just because they're connected to prod or UAT that they're somehow the same repository and the same branch structure. Sure, but if I specify that they are the same repository in DevOps and to use the same branches, then that's not the same thing. No, because um, if you start a project and you say, start at prod, create a main branch, that's that project's main branch. It's not the same branch, right? But when you, you start a project, you, know, you can specify an existing an existing uh, repository. That's true, but you would have to then track every one of those boxes back to branches, right? So as soon as you create that project, just make sure you're not creating unrelated branches. And that that the sandboxes themselves have nothing to do with what's happening in GitHub. I feel like there might be a disconnect there. Maybe I could be wrong. I usually am. Okay. Because everything that everything everyone's saying is like valid decisions, but you can have fifty dev boxes feeding one pipeline. That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Yeah. Is that the quantity shouldn't make a difference? Yeah, it confuses it, but it shouldn't really make a difference at the end of the day. Completely. And and GitHub does your compares and syncing. So there's no point in a pipeline where my work and your work don't merge at some point and don't compare to each other. Even a hotfix. The reason yeah. a hotfix might break things is because you've jumped out of the pipeline and done with the change set or done manually, which is why I've seen people do the deploy it, but then deploy it again kind of mentality. But if you've got changes coming from point A and point B and they don't know about each other until they start fighting at a box, it's because you've got two unique repositories fighting for content and they're just deploying into a sandbox that knows nothing about their repository. It's just doing push pulls into that environment. And, and my point is with that, the quantity doesn't matter. This is also where one can be many. True. So yes. when, when you go through the, the question of do, does something need to have a child object versus fields, expanding out on the parent object, one child record is still many because you may have many. Start with the one and then determine if you need more at like at a, at a dev level okay. or, or a GitHub level, whatever, whatever. But start small, work your way out because it's a lot harder to start big and work your way in. 
Sounds good. I appreciate everybody's input and help. We've Please give us feedback because we're all learning about Dev Center. Um, I really like it. We haven't had that kind of challenge, but we also haven't been putting a ton. Can of I just ask, on. like, straight up, what you like? Do you have a single pipeline in your DevOps Center? We only we only need one pipeline because of the type of changes we're doing. Uh, we we were using two projects that were connected to a full sandbox as a starting point. And then having a pipeline that was going from that full sandbox to prod. So we were. And, and sorry, you keep saying as a starting point, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. The starting point for you is the, the like last output, the highest thing up on the ladder, right? Sorry. So, yes. Yeah. So, so the first branch. Okay. So like the, the main yes. is tied to the our main. full sandbox. Yeah. And then we're then doing a change, uh, like a, like a compare from our full sandbox to prod as the last step. And that turned out to be way more work than it was worth. And okay. so what we got That's down to is a single project. The pipeline starts at prod, works through three sandboxes. We don't use bundling. And then we have sandboxes assigned to each admin or dev. And we regularly either close the sandboxes, but not like refresh it. Like we decide like, Sandbox seven is now garbage. We're gonna if you're gonna start this new project or this new workflow, not sorry, not workflow, but you know, like new work item. Yeah, create yeah. a new box. Let's connect it to the pipeline and, and off and running. And because you can do the syncs and the true ups to the to that last branch, you know it's always syncing. We haven't had issues. Do you have any sort of policy about how long work items stay open for? Or like one, because right, you create the work item and then you actually have to go in and be like, all right, now I'm going to use it. Here's the environment that it's yeah. mapped to. So like from that point, how long does it sit before like? So our policy, going back to what Dale was talking about, our policy is that anything that's a size eight, and I'll talk about that in a second, is too big. We call it the WTF size. Mm -hmm. Everything we work on, we try to make sure is complete and deployable to the next iteration or like basically close the, the story within five days most of them are more like one to two because we want to say that work is done we can test it we can move it forward and we can go to the next thing and then if you pick up a new story you can immediately sync it back down or anybody who's behind, like not as fast as you knows they have to do a compare and sync before they deploy their changes that we know we know they merge okay so um it also gets you to i mean not only from a capacity standpoint but it also really makes you think about the actual technical solution that you implement. And Squire, maybe you mentioned this and I wasn't completely in tune with it, but if you've come up with a requirement that is eight points, for example, I'm picturing this big old mass of code or a gigantic flow that does all that da, 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 versus technically should those be broken into smaller gears so that down the road if something breaks you're not trying to fix the whole freaking thing you're you're in a position to be able to swap out parts and yeah. not not break the rest of the thing yeah 100 percent. i mean you you have to be able to get that work done and deployed and not deployed but like sent off for qa and testing in bytes otherwise you aren't agile you're you're doing things different i mean and that's really been our message anything that's an eight the first question is why is it an eight nine times out of ten in our case it's because of the amount of testing or the amount of data work or the amount of like user experience work that we need to do it's not actually what we deployed it's more about how long it's going to take to get it out of that next box mm -hmm. and, and like at ibm if we see something that's eight 13 20 plus that's automatically no longer a story it's a feature Right. That gets broken down into more stories. Agreed. Okay. Interesting. Thanks, guys. And everybody, yeah. I appreciate it. It's very helpful. Jack, I, I I one last thing. I would, I don't know how familiar you are with GitHub. You're you're a developer. You've used it, right? I I will use my go-to line, which is I know enough to be dangerous. Perfect. <laughs> dangerous is my middle name. Um, I would triple check that you don't have you haven't generated repositories by accident even though your intent was to have them all rely on the same uh branching structure that you don't have yeah that i'm that i'm 100 I, I i'm good enough at it to know that yes <laughs> <laughs> all right cool cool hey um there was a couple posts by andrea and sarah about capato do you want to jump in here and speak to anything that we've talked about as far as that space um so i used it 
been a previous or current one now we're on github and that's different argument not argument different ex different experience because we have a couple different groups but um in lieu of change sets we would uh, i had a con uh, consultant we were working with was like oh using click deploy when it was click deploy for compatible about them i really liked it because it's kind of a middle ground between chain sets where you're like okay i have to go find all the fields i edited where Capato Essentials will, will show you those diffs, like what changed or what's new and so on and so forth, and also show you the actual relevant related pieces versus the change set where it's like all the things. Um, and you can run your um, test, like you can test it and, and validate it, that's the word. Um, right in that UI, um, you can set multiple sandbox, you can have multiple pipelines, you can go from sandbox to sandbox and then sandbox to prod. Um, there is a limit with the free version per month. I don't remember what it is, um, but I compared to change sets, it, like that was night and day and it was less Again, it's a happy, I feel like it was for me, it was a happy medium between GitHub and that and change sets. So Capado Essentials is free, so it's worth worth a go, is my my thought on it. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, um my experience has been very similar to Andrea's that um I'm a solo admin in a nonprofit org and our our sort of DevOps world is I have a bunch of sandboxes that I do different projects in and then I push each of those projects to prod from a different sandbox. Um, and Capado lets me make as big a deployment or as little a deployment as I want. It's not very well governed because it's just me. <laughs> um, so I'm not following best practices, but it's a great tool. And the only reason I started paying for it was as I needed more deploy jobs and like I ran into like, oh shit, I hit my limit and I really need to deploy today. I'm going to pay for it. And now I have it for a year. Hooray. But um, it's been great for me uh, without having, like, I want to learn more about GitHub and DevOps and all of that. But like the learning curve is a little bit too steep when I have to actually get things done tomorrow. So Capato hits the spot. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo everything Sarah and the other folks have said. Capato is, is awesome. <laughs> and little to no learning curve on it it's a super nice interface oh and to be clear this is essentials which i think is a separate product from they have other more robust products but essentials yeah. is kind of like change sets plus so it can be a little confusing looking at their offerings which one we're talking about but i see it yeah 15 deployments a month for the free version it looks like yeah that's the, that's the one okay cool yeah, it's it's a pretty low limit, so I still do simple ones with the the native change sets. But when I know I'm going to have my tentacles going out to other places, I'll use Capato because it's easier to pull them together. Well, great, and thank you again, everybody. Apologies for chewing up thirty to forty minutes on DevOps. You don't, you don't get to apologize, Jack. If it helps, it helps. It helps all of us. So no apologies necessary. Um, there were no questions behind you either. So as the broadcast journalism major, um, I appreciate you filling the dead air. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here. That's what I'm here for, filler. There's a ton of, for anyone who's interested, there's a ton of really great DevOps Center video content that Karen and team has put out. So if you're just starting and you're not sure what we're talking about, check it out. Um, there's also some really good and you need to know GitHub type stuff that is tied to DevOps Center, that would be not enough to be a GitHub expert, but enough to understand the whole, like, why do I do what I do and what's a pull and what's a push and what's a change request and all that stuff. So is there a, with the last couple of minutes, something that I have become really paranoid about is sizing. Does everyone use sizing? I know you do, Dale. It's such an art that I'm sure everyone, I'm sure everyone uses sizing, but are you S sizing? Like 
it's it's tricky but yeah. that that's part of the beauty of it is is it's adaptable just like agile there is no one way to do agile it's right. a framework not a rule we did a really cool exercise with our sizing because we have different teams working on different platforms and um, we went through it's like take, bring us a bunch of stories that are not currently sized and let's go through and and say what you know how many what size or how many points or whatever it is do you think this is but then you compared it okay well is this more or less work than this starting point and then we put in the points or the sizes or whatever up above that but then we came up with like a general criteria like what do these have in common like changing a list you filter like that's you know for us half a point because it's something we those aren't checked into github so it's just done right in production that's fine but if you, once you have to start needing a scratch org or something then it goes up from there so it was kind of interesting to do um and then keeping in mind that it's relative per team so what takes our sales you know our sale our salesforce team takes is something is two or three it yeah different levels of work so it's kind of interesting i think it was worth doing and, and even more granularly not just per team but per resource yep. a junior is going to take longer than a senior a junior is not going to be as well equipped as a senior a developer may have a different capacity than an administrator like there it like it really is people specific which again is part of the beauty of it and i love complex math but it's all complex math it's a framework not a rule we did something that in that space because we when we first when i first joined at at uh my current firm there was kind of this underlying I'm a programmatic developer, so my stories are eights. You're a declarative developer, yours are 0.5s. And it was really hard to break that that like analogy down. And so we invented something called the the <laughs> the the square size because I pushed for it. And what we did was we did a little exercise where we asked everyone to talk about like send in your bullet points of how you size, like what do you what do you use to de develop like identify identify your sizing and there was like 30 unique bullets on that list and when it came down to it what we realized was that everyone looks at it in a in a level of complexity and time and so then we built a grid that basically said every story we should be talking about it in those two rulers you might have other opinions but boil it down to those opinions and then what you said about the resourcing what we could do is say it might take an experienced job developer a three to do that story but we want a junior developer to learn we're going to make it an eight and let them spin and now we know why it's taking longer right or or it's really complex but not hard so it should be quick but we need a lot of attention to it so we're going to bump it up or pull it back so it was i mean all those nuances are like an, you have to be a um, um you have to be dale to figure it out so well we're all screwed <laughs> No, All right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's a multi-dimensional equation. It yep. just is. And you have to revisit it. We have not oh, yeah. looked at ours in a while, and we're starting to wonder why everything's a 0.5, and it's because our our everything has changed, and we need to put, think about it again. So, If, you've ev if anybody's ever actually gone deep into um, safe agile and the, the concept of release trains, et cetera. And you look at the, the, um, the picture that they put up there of how it works from end to end and whatever, there's a ton of loops. There's a ton of repeat, repeat, repeat. And there's really one at the end there of when you have a retrospective, what worked, what didn't, whatever, that's where those adjustments come in. Like, yeah. it, and I will say required reading for anybody exploring that is, um, Dweck's mindset. You have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Growth mindset is going to go back and refine. A fixed mindset is just going to keep doing it the same way, run into problems and not know why. And for those of you who thought that Dale was having a, a minor stroke when he said that, Dweck is the author, mindset is the book. Thank you. You bet. All right, we got 40 seconds left. 
we melted Jack's brain. I got to get on my soapbox. Dale dropped some sick knowledge on us. Anything else before we go? Happy Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. Friday. Have a good weekend. Happy Earth Day. Do something good for the world. There you go. This was a start, but you need to do more. <laughs> Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.